For me, it was always a bit of an adult thrill to come downstairs on a Sunday morning, the household still sleeping, and find the table, the long formal table in the dining room, strewn with the last debris of the late finishing dinner party given by my parents the night before. I used to read the dinner table detritus left behind, the clementine rinds, the felt tip pen, the corks and foils, the little pile of strawberry hulls, as if they were fossil impressions, not of seahorses or prehistoric invertebrates, but of the conversations that we had there just hours earlier, records of a grown-up discussion I was dying to be allowed to join. It has always been clear to me that a dinner party is about what is said, not what is eaten. There would always be wine and bread and salad and stew, chocolate, fruit and nuts, and sparkling cold duck. But those were just the props, the conduits for funny and meaningful conversation, the set pieces of a lively, engaged, lingering, old school dinner party the one that I have been chasing ever since. This essay by Gabriel Hamilton, a wonderful food writer and the chef owner of Prune in New York City, is what we were thinking about when we landed on the theme of good food and food fights for this year's Summer Institute. One long dinner party where the conversation was lively and yes, focused on food, but also all the proxies food stand for, love, labor, family, nourishment, togetherness, comfort. Welcome to the sixth session of the 2021 Summer Institute. My name is Lynn Bolger, and I am the executive director of the Authors Guild Foundation, known better in these parts as a retired COA staffer. I am here to introduce this session, Lights, Camera, Bowtie, with Will Thorndike interviewing his friend, Christopher Kimball. Among the many things Will is that you can read about in your program, he is also a longtime summer resident of MDI, as were many of his family members before him. The COA library is named after his aunt and uncle, Betty and Amory Thorndike who over 50 years ago helped make the idea of this college come to life. He is also the founder with Judith Goldstein of this institute, as Beth Gardner mentioned at the opening session. He and Judy, between then, conceived of a week-long symposia, which I thought was such a dumb idea. <laughs> who would come on a beautiful summer afternoon off the hiking trail or water to talk about democracy. But we staff, you know, he was the board chair, we humored him. <laughs> we muddled along thinking, let's see how poor a turnout there was and would never have to repeat the experiment. This is why I do not bet on races. But Will did know, he's a rangy guy, mostly because in my humble opinion, he was an English major at Harvard, and English majors are rangy sort of people. But he also earned an MBA from the Stanford School of something or other. <laughs> Business, that's it. And he says he started Housatonic Partners, a private equity firm out of a closet. And though he is mostly retired from that, he is still an investor and a mentor to many CEOs. He is the author of the book, The Outsiders, number one on Warren Buffett's recommended reading list, Berkshire Hathaway Annual Shareholder Letter, 2012. He is the owner of David Godin Publishers. He has served on so many boards, so many boards, including this board, and is a current member of the Authors Guild Foundation Board, mostly because he believes in service and giving back, but also I think he is allergic to downtime. He is a collector of people. I have no idea how he knows Chris Kimball, but I hope he will tell us when he introduces Chris now. Join me in welcoming Will Back and Chris to the Summer Institute. Thanks very much, Lynn. Um, I just wanna say it's impossible to overstate Lynn's role in Lynn's role in building the Summer Institute over the last few years. So I just want to say 
thank you right back at you, Lynn, for everything on multiple levels. Thank you. So it's a delight to be up here with uh, Chris Kimball this afternoon. Chris and I have known by, each... By the way, I'm very nervous. <laughs> so I just... There's a lot of material. I'm very nervous about I have this a one. lot of material. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. Chris Great. and I have known each other almost 30 years now. Uh, our relationship originated in business. Uh, I've been fortunate to be an investor, an investor in both of Chris's companies, um, but it quickly evolved into friendship. And it's really fun to finally have Chris here on MDI. It's taken a long time to lure him. It took the Summer Institute, so it's nice to have him here. So I'm going to give you a little background on Chris. So Chris went to Exeter and Columbia, which he entered in the fall of 1969, just as the Vietnam War protests were reaching their most intense phase. He then made his way through a variety of publishing jobs and cooking classes before starting the original Cook's Magazine in 1980 at the age of 29. He sold that magazine in 1989, and in 1993 he created Cook's Illustrated, which pioneered an entirely new model for the publishing industry, eliminating advertising revenue and focusing instead on building a fiercely loyal base of subscribers. Editorially, the publication also broke new ground by pioneering an approach that focused on the rigorous testing of recipes. He later added books and a television show under the America's Test Kitchen brand. Five years ago, in his mid-60s, as he found his <laughs> Thanks own... Thanks for mentioning that. <laughs> it's an important detail, which we will return to. Uh, as he found his own cooking evolving toward bolder flavors and ingredients, Chris left to start Milk Street, which now has a magazine, a top PBS TV show, the highest rated food cast on Apple iTunes, a growing library of book titles, and a thriving online store. In just five years, under Chris's leadership, Milk Street has remarkably already won three Emmys and two James Beard Awards. Chris also wove a broader educational mission into Milk Street's DNA. Traditionally, in most publishing and media businesses, there's a clear church and state-like division between the creative types, the editors, writers, directors, actors, sort of the cool kids, who put out the TV shows and magazines. So they're on one side. On the other side, you have the business people, the suits, who manage the rest of the operation. Chris, however, is uniquely rangy. Uh, he has the ability to function in both spheres. He is both sacred and profane in Darren's construct from uh, this morning. He can tell you both every single article in the next two issues of the magazine and the unit sales for the top five items at the store last week. In other words, beneath the bow tie, There's no the bow tie, suit, I just want to say. The blazer, the blazer, whatever you've got on. There's actually a fair amount of cool underneath, is my point. So uh, we're going to skip around a bit, but we're going to pull on both of those threads as we go through things here. So please join me in welcoming Chris Kimball. OK, so uh, starting points are important in, in any narrative. And I want to sort of lock in the before picture. You, you see the after picture here, but I want to lock in the before picture. Um, and so before we dive in on cooking and business and your career, um, I wondered if you might quickly relate the toll booth here we story. Go. Here we go. <laughs> this is a story that Chris told Jeannie and I over dinner the other night. Um, what a mistake, though. Known as the toll booth story. So this might be a place to start. This is why I referenced the anti-war movement earlier on in Columbia. So maybe we'll start there, Chris. Is Sam still here from the New York Times? I just want to make sure. Oh, great. That's terrific. Uh, yeah, thank you for that, Will. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, this was 1970. I was out in California for the summer and chasing the Grateful Dead around, which I did a lot in those days. And I, I majored in anti-war protests at Columbia. That's, I think I got a, 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 you know, a bachelor's. Uh, I, I was coming back in a 61 VW, and I had a large English sheepdog who kept running in circles in the car because we were driving 10, 12 hours at a time. So I, I got to Washington, and I took a wrong turn and was heading to Philadelphia for some reason. And my car died because it had vapor lock. The old VWs had vapor lock all the time. <laughs> So I woke up early Sunday morning, drove to the Ben Franklin Bridge in Philadelphia, and I was tailgating cars in front of me because I had no money. 
So to get through the toll booth, um, I, I could probably still be arrested for that, I guess. But I was arrested, actually, for that, uh, because there was a big drug bust in New Jersey that day. So I just, the timing was terrible. So they, they arrested me, and they arrested my dog, too. The dog was under arrest. Uh, and they, they took all my clothes away, like all of them. And I was in, put in a jail cell with a guy who just robbed a liquor store. And thanks for this, I just, I just want to thank you again for telling the story. So, uh, and then I ended up at the fourth detective precinct when Rizzo was mayor. It was a tough time in Philadelphia. The guy in front of me stepped out to get a, some water. We were staying in line to get photographed, and he was beaten to a pulp. You know, that was great. So I was in a holding cell. I got out. And a week later, I come back for a hearing, and the judge was Eastern European. I, I don't know which country, but he didn't speak English very well. And the, uh, the city's uh, lawyer stood up and said, there was insufficient evidence to prosecute. And the reason was I had a big bag of sugar in the car, which they thought was something else, which it wasn't. Uh, and, and so the, the, the judge goes, like, sufficient evidence to prosecute, <laughs> starts writing it down. And, and my lawyer stands up, Your Honor, this is, a, this is a travesty of justice, and blah, blah, blah. And he said, You have five seconds to leave the courtroom, uh, or I'm going to throw the book at your client. So that was it. I was out, and I got a haircut and a suit. But what, was the hair, what was the hair length at that juncture? Just to sort of... uh, it was rangy. It was... <laughs> it was long and rangy. Now, I, 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 it wasn't the moment I decided to start Cooks. It was the moment I decided the life of crime was just really not going to work out for me. I just didn't, I didn't have the, you know, the grit for it. So, anyway, thank you. Yeah, yeah, good place. So we have the before picture locked yeah. in, I hope. Okay, so, um, so where did... Your interest in cooking start, who were some of your earliest influences? Um, I was very fortunate, as many of you know, to spend summers and weekends in Vermont, the same place I am today. Uh, it was, I worked on a small farm. It was a mountain farm. No indoor plumbing until 1969. Pump in the sink. Green Kalamazoo wood stove. Uh, Marie Briggs was, uh, lived there and was the town baker. So she was running the town line from Arlington. So when you went in and out of town, you'd stop by, and she'd give you a slice of bread and butter and a cup of tea or whatever. Uh, and I would help the farmers. I worked on a dairy farm, and then we raised our own Angus and pigs later on. But, so I'd worked on a dairy farm in hay in the summer, and, uh, and on a rainy day, she, she would, I would go in and help cook. The thing, the thing about Vermonters, like Mainers, I would assume, is they, you move to Vermont, or you grew up in Vermont, because you don't want anyone telling you what to do. I mean, that's the fundamental concept, which I'm sure is the same here. So she would never tell me what to do. She would show me. And so if I was kneading bread the wrong way, she'd stand next to me and do it the right way. She'd never make eye contact, and she'd leave. And I was like 10 years old. I was going like, oh, OK. I think she was trying to tell me something. And years later, I, there was a guy, uh, uh, Harley Smith, uh, and there was a big storm in our town. Some big trees went down. And I was, I had my 18 inch steel chainsaw and uh, I was saw, and the, the tree was down. And if you know anything about chainsawing, you have to really look carefully to see where the tree's supported and which way it's gonna go. It's gonna go like this or this. So I was, I was going down, but I didn't realize that the, it was gonna open up. So Harley, who was about 80 at the time, had his big like 24 inch saw. He got right next to me and he just went from the bottom like this and then he, then he walked away. <laughs> and so I learned a lot about teaching from that, because telling people what to do isn't nearly as effective as, as showing them. Uh, and that, that's where I got interested in food, because, you know, food, there's been a lot of talk about food philosophically, food is art. Food in America, I think, was fuel. Uh, it really was, and especially on that farm. It didn't mean they didn't enjoy their food. It didn't mean the food wasn't critical to how they, they sat around the table. But you never talked about, you didn't go like, boy, that pot roast was good tonight, you know, or I really like the, that anadama bread. It was just part of life. It was an essential part, but it wasn't talked about. And I think that the way food has been part of it, especially New England, uh, is, is very different than the rest of the world. Um, so I think that, that really influenced my interest in food. And um, can you tell us about your relationship with Julia Childs and also what you think her legacy is today? Well, it's, it's child, first of all. I'm sorry. Child. I just, people do say child. Um, well, if you think about Julia, uh, there was a piece in The New Yorker about this years ago. Uh, someone interviewed me for it. I said, it, she came on the scene just at the point where we were stopping cooking, right? Her timing, it, it was so strange because the, uh, 
processed food was getting going. You know, sugar pops were tops. You know, frosted flakes were great. Uh, and she comes around the 60s, and through sheer force of personality, she managed to get us interested in cooking French food, which was also, you know, going to be on its last legs pretty soon. So if you think about it, she arrived at sort of at the wrong time in the wrong place, but it was her. And so she convinced people like me that I should be cooking, you know, Simone Beck's recipes, <laughs> essentially. Uh, and it was just this amazing cultural thing that, that she was able to do that. And she was always very annoyed if you said to her, you know, you, you're really good on TV or, or you're a good entertainer. She hated that. She always thought of herself as an educator. But she managed to single-handedly do something that was totally went against where America was going, right? Uh, and so I give her just amazing credit for that. But she, when I moved to uh, Boston in the early 90s, uh, I was in the South End right next to, I was in St. Elsewhere right next to the hospital. There's a lot of stories about that. But uh, I got a call at work. This is Julia. You know, I said, excuse me? This is Julia Child. It's like, I said, no, it isn't. <laughs> Come on, okay, who is it? No, it's Julia. She got, she got pissed off, you know, Julia. So we should come over for dinner. So I, I said, fine, when? Tomorrow. So fine, so I, I show up at six, and you know, she has this door that was in this little room next to the kitchen. And she opens the door, and this huge, you know, Julia Childs fills the doorway. So we go in, and uh, she, she, she was actually fairly competitive. She liked to know if you knew how to cook. You know, she always telling you I should go to France and train, like she told everybody else, which I never did. And uh, so she gave me this, you know, service box with oysters. You know, could you shuck these oysters? And I said, well, I was terrible at it at the time, and I'm still not great at it. But so like 10 minutes go by, I've shucked two oysters, I have a bloody finger. <laughs> it was like a complete train wreck, you know. And she'd come over, well, do you need some help, dearie? <laughs> she always said, dearie, you know. And I said, yeah, I need some help. I need a big bloody glass of wine. You shuck the oysters, and then we, this will be fine. <laughs> and that was great. We got along great after that. You know, but she, um, she was also... She was interested, in, she asked me in her later years when she was at, out on the West Coast, uh, she was very interested in Martha, you know, and she, she wanted to know about Martha Stewart because she wasn't, a, you know, she didn't care about money. A lot of the money she made from GBH in her books went to Smith College and into GBH. Mm. She didn't care about money, and she, but she was really interested in a woman who had made this career and, you know, gotten out of Time Warner and started this amazing brand. So she was fascinated by <laughs> successful women and, and how they did it. So she was really a piece of work. The other time I went to a garden party, she had it for a book for a friend of hers, and she served Swedish meatballs and grape jelly. So I just want you to know that, you know, <laughs> not everything was French. Um, okay, so how would you summarize your sort of philosophy of cooking and then maybe two or three meals that fed into the development of that? So some specific... You know, cooking, I mean, there are the Sam Siftons of the world, the Ruth Reichels of the world, there's the Eric Repairs of the world, the Tony Burdans of the world. There's lots of different ways to cut, cut at it. I think I'm deeply influenced by Vermont because it was very practical. And so I, I, I'm not uh, philosophical discussions about the meaning of food. Is food art? Is probably not my meat and potatoes. <laughs> Uh, much more practical. I mean, my, my idea is just to get people in the kitchen. I mean, I, I'm still a 60s guy because I actually believe this. I have a little Alice Waters in me, which is I actually think if people cooked more, all the problems in the world would be solved. <laughs> That's a little, little <laughs> oversimplistic, I admit, but you know, I really do believe that people cooked. Your diets would be better. You wouldn't have all these health problems. Uh, you'd have a better marriage. You'd have a better family, a better neighborhood. You, you care about the ingredients. Things would be more local, um, and you'd just be happier, you know? So my philosophy of food is just to get more people in the kitchen. I'd be really thrilled if five of you after tonight spent more time in the kitchen the next year. I'd be feel that was a success. You know, that's all I care about. I've had people come up to me over the years literally in tears to say, you know, thank you. You know, now I enjoy cooking. And, and so I, it's just an enjoyment of cooking. I, I don't, I'm not going to put it in a broader context. I just think it's nice to get people in the kitchen. And if you start there, all these other things happen. But, um, you know, I'm not, I, I have a very practical sense of just getting that first step, getting someone in the kitchen. If you get someone to the point where they, especially with Milk Street, where they can produce something they didn't think they could do, you know, the food is that much better. And I hear that a lot. 
you know, I made that Thai coleslaw, and that was just amazing. The, the flavors are big, they're bold, it wasn't hard. Uh, you know, if you think about French cooking, and I digress, but um, if you think about northern European food, you have kind of bland ingredients with time and temperature and technique, you develop flavor, right? You know, uh, and so uh, beef bourguignon, the recipe I like to make fun of the most. Um, other cultures start with big flavors. They have fermented sauces, they have chilies, they have spices, they have lemongrass, you know, they have ginger. So if you start with big flavors, the process is really easy because you're starting with big flavors, you end with big flavors. You know, stir fry takes three minutes. So the, 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 the thing that's held us back is, in a way, is what Julia was teaching us, which is it's about practice. It's about years of going to cooking school. You don't need to do that. You, you can produce great food fairly quickly, and a lot of cultures do that very well. So th that's my, my feeling is give people you know, a recipe that they can go in the kitchen and go, wow, that, that was pretty cool. And, and then the kitchen becomes the most exciting room in the house. You know, it used to be when I was a kid in the 50s and 60s, the kitchen was the place you wanted to be least because it was an, it was an inconvenient truth, right? It was work. So if everyone was selling you on convenience so you wouldn't have to cook. You know, as, you know, it's the cooking, stupid, right? I mean, it is the cooking. That's my philosophy, it's the cooking. It's not the food, it's not everything else. It's the cooking. You should enjoy the process of cooking. It's fun. Um, and and most, most of cooking's prep, so when you get the prep done, the actual cooking is fun. You know, it should be fun. It should be something you enjoy and look forward to uh, and do with other people. And so I'm passionate about it, um, but I'm not, a, I'm not a food philosopher, I guess. So a couple of touchstone meals. Uh, well, okay, I'll start from the most expensive to the least expensive. The most, the most amazing meal I ever had in my life was at Freddy Girardet's in Crissier, Switzerland in the 80s. I was uh, cross-country skiing in the Jura, and, and I, made, I wanted to interview him for cooks. So I, I interviewed him in the morning. Uh, he was soft-spoken, uh, only had one restaurant, didn't have a place in Disney World, uh, shopped himself at 4.30 in the morning in the local. His father also had a place there when, years ago. And the food was just unbelievable. I mean, everything was perfect. Uh, and there was like maybe 15 tables. It was very small. Uh, and, and he didn't care about being famous. He didn't care about you know, opening in, in, in Hong Kong. He just did his restaurant. And I remember a foie gras, perfectly crisp on both sides, little vinegar and herb on it, uh, or a, a tart vaudoise, which is nothing but a paper thin, the pastry, when they rolled out the pastry, you could see through it, a pat sucre, and it was so thin, and then they'd have a little layer like maybe half inch of cream, just cream. There was no egg in it or anything. With, with, he put sugar at the bottom and cream and a little cinnamon on top and baked it. And the cream was so good that it set up on its own, which would never work with supermarket cream here. And so it was perf perfection and simple. Um, the second meal was in, in 69, I drove, um, I drove from London to Nairobi. It's a long story. <laughs> and I wasn't trying to get away from the police or anything. It was just, it was, it was a real trip. So we ended up uh, in, in North Africa, and uh, I was not far from Iran. And we had three Land Rovers who were camping, obviously. We weren't staying at a hotel. Uh, and I took a, a walk with a couple of friends, and we saw a campfire. And there were th three, I think, Berbers there cooking couscous over fire, and they invited us to dinner. And of course, we didn't speak the same language. But I realized we actually could have a conversation. And it was just this amazing food. And just and you're sitting there, sitting down on the ground, overlooking, you know. And then my third meal was uh, a few years ago, I was, uh, I was rabbit hunting in Vermont with my friend Tom who, and uh, a guy called Teddy, who's no longer with us. But Teddy, it was about 20 degrees out. It was very deep snow. Uh, he had sneakers on and no socks. He had three shirts that were half open, no hat and no gloves, and two great dogs. And we went after snowshoe hares, which are big, big animals. And uh, for lunch, he took out some hot dogs, started the fire. He didn't even have buns or mustard. <laughs> so we ate grilled hot dogs over fire in 20 degrees on a sunny day in February, and it was just a great meal. Um, so that's my, from Freddy's year day to hot dogs. And I, I can't tell you which one I... I remember most fondly. It may have been the hot dogs. <laughs> Very rangy. That was rangy. 
Okay, so um, I know you pretty well, and you are a relentless, unsatisfied innovator by nature. Um, and I think your first sort of most significant, you know, innovation that caused a stir was the test kitchen concept that was sort of the heart of Cook's Illustrated, pretty revolutionary at the time. Where did that come from? What frustration brought that about? Well, I think at the time, um, I think it was fair to say that in food publishing, it wasn't that the recipes weren't tested, but they, they weren't tested from the point of view of how people actually cook at home. Because if you actually spend time watching people cook at home, and, and I include myself, they do some pretty weird stuff. Um, you know, they, 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 and, and so to really understand how someone uses a recipe at home uh, is really important because you have to explain things you don't think you'd have to explain, or you have to ex say, what is it? You can't just say bake for 25 minutes because everyone's oven's different. It doesn't mean anything. Well, how do you know when it's done? You know, that's like my, one of my kids is a baker, and she still calls me and asks me, you know, how do you know when it's done? Well, that's actually a good question. And so how do you tell people when it's done? How do you know when the pan's hot enough? How do you, you know, how do you, know when the, you should flip the steak or whatever? So really thinking the way a home cook thinks, as opposed to how a foodie thinks, someone with experience, was really important. Because my, my thinking was, if, if people have a good experience with recipes and they actually work, um, you know, Marion Cunningham, you probably know who she was. She was a protege of James Beard. She wrote, uh, Jim got her to write the updated Fannie Farmer baking book. And um, she used to live uh, outside of Walnut Creek, outside of San Francisco. And she used to give a class every Saturday morning for free uh, to teach people to cook. And she always, it stuck with me what she said. She said, fear of failure was the number one thing, right? That's, that's why people don't cook. They're afraid of failing, of course. If you fail as many times as I have, <laughs> you just get used to it. But, uh, and so she, she, would, she would go through failure and get them used to it. Uh, another friend of mine in, Bo in Boston uh, who did the East Coast Grill, Chris, he, he used to give cooking classes, and he'd take a piece of fish and put it on the grill and burn it into cinders. And then, then people got over that, you know, and then they, then, then they would show them how to do it right. So I, I think um, understanding the psychology of someone who's worried about failure and taking them by the hand and, and saying, okay, here's what's going to happen, and explaining what it looks like, what it's going to smell like. You know, a lot of, a lot of cooks uh, cook by sound. Like, if I'm hmm. listening to onions cooking, I can tell whether it's too fast or too slow. You can hear it. So talking about the noise things make. Uh, you know, when a chocolate cake is done in the oven, you can smell the chocolate, right? It, all of a sudden, you can smell chocolate. Okay, that's probably done. So, so really holding people's hands is, is really important because... Um, it's not about the romance, it's not about the travel, it's, it's about having that recipe work, because ultimately that's what matters. Uh, and if they have a good experience with it, they feel good about themselves and they feel good about what you're doing, and then you know, hopefully they'll come back. So uh, at the risk of sounding like Guy Raz from How I Built This, you know, what, what was the light bulb moment for Milk Street for you? Well, I mean, if, if you think about what's happened in the last 20 years, you know, in arts, in architecture, in film, in fashion, and everything else, uh, you know, the world's gotten very small. It's a mishmash music. Um, and so you, you no longer have isolated pockets, right? Everything's come together. So this has happened in the restaurant business the last 20 years, of course. Um, and so it hasn't, but it didn't happen at home yet. And the reason it hasn't happened at home is people didn't have access to the ingredients. Uh, it's hard for people to get out of one way of cooking and cook a different way. And my feeling was what I had been doing all along, which was traditional American cooking, although that's a fraught with all sorts of meaning, but classic cooking, uh, mostly Northern European, you know, it, it was going to go away. It, it just wasn't going to become the, the, the dominant approach because all these other cultures offer, I think, a better way to cook. It's easier, it's, it's better flavors, it's fresher. Meat is not on the center of the plate. You know, meat is, is a flavoring. Uh, vegetables are important. Grains are important. Uh, techniques are different. You know, if, uh, in uh, the, um, what, what's that wonderful book uh, about uh, Sichuan cooking? But she, she writes about it. She says uh, it's, there are 59 different cooking techniques in this one region. And you go like, oh, well, that's a few <laughs> more than I know. So, I mean, if, if you, I was in Taipei years ago and I watched someone, you know, the typical restaurant kitchen with six walks, you know. I watched someone in 10 minutes 
he deep fried, he steamed, he sauteed, he did like eight things all in the same pan in like 10 minutes. I'm going like, okay, well, I, I need to figure this out because this is really cool. So I, I just thought the world of home cooking was gonna completely change forever. And it, it wasn't a question of doing what we did back in the 60s and 70s, which is, you know, Paula Wolfer would go to Morocco and, and show you a three-day recipe for making couscous, great. This isn't that. It's like you go and, and work with people in Oaxaca, and you're not going to make a tlayuda exactly the way they do, but you're going to learn something new about cooking. You're going to learn something new about ingredients and go like, oh, okay, I can, I can use that in the way I cook. So I, I just thought there was going to be a huge revolution. I think it's true that that's now people are, and also social media has introduced us to, I mean, that's com a complete game changer. So now, now it's in our face. We can see it all the time. And it's comfortable because it's been reduced to a very palatable, consumable bit. Um, and so I, I just thought that world was going to disappear. If you think about it, that made sense for a time and a place, right? Every, every culture has a, a sense of cooking that makes sense for them. But I don't think, you know, French cooking right now, some of it does, but, you know, it made sense at a certain time. But there are other things out there now, I think, that are much more interesting. And what was it like to start a business 20 years after your first one? What, what was most different? Am I allowed to cry now <laughs> on, on stage? Um, it, well, you, you know, I've talked about this. I mean, I think the, the good news is you've been doing something a long time. You've learned, hopefully, learned some lessons. Um, at the same time, you know, people don't change. So I thought, oh, I'm going to start a new company. I'm going to be totally different. I'm going to be a great manager. You know, I'm going to be organized. <laughs> and, like, I'm still a lousy manager. I'm totally disorganized. I, I wake up at 5.15 every morning having no idea what's on my schedule, literally. I have to look at my phone and hit the schedule for the calendar to see what I'm doing. That I, Maybe I'm supposed to be in California. I don't know. Um, but that being said, I, I did think that um, it, my only insight is that uh, we, we used to compartmentalize our lives. You used to go shopping. I mean, I, I grew up in a pre-mall era, so you go to your little stores, you know, and then you went to the mall. So you, you do shopping, and then uh, you'd see your friends, you know, and then uh, you would talk politics, and then whatever. So everything was in a separate box. Now with TikTok and Twitter and Instagram and everything else, all of this has come together into your feed. Your whole life is in your feed now, and so shopping is. It is it, there isn't a separation between buying things and reading things and listening to things. It's all together. And that's a huge change. And so you're going to see the way the economy works and the way we think about the food world. And I think the food world's a great you know, canary in the coal mine. It's on the leading edge of all of this because it's so ubiquitous. It's all going to come together in a way where it's seamless. And so I just thought, OK, you can take, food is at the basis of almost everything, right? You can talk about anything through food, as someone said earlier, I think uh, maybe Ruth did, but the, the point is all of that and commerce is gonna come together. Well, everything you do, how you spend your money, uh, what you wear, what you eat, where you shop, all that stuff is all gonna come together seamlessly. And, and that's, a, that's a change nobody has figured out yet. And I, I, I gotta believe at Amazon, someone's getting nervous because Amazon's its own ecosystem that sits over here like it's, going, it's like a big mall, right? But that's not how we're going to shop in the future. We're not going over to the mall. We'll be here in our feed. So what does that mean? It means that I, th I think that when people spend their money, they care about uh, the surround. They care about the voice. They care about the people selling it. They care, they care about the curation of things. Um, they they want to know more about the company. Uh, and so they, they want a personal interaction with you in a brand, and just a, a faceless e-commerce uh, site, I, th I think is problematic long term. P people want personal. Um, I'll give you a great example. There's a, I was in Brattleboro. I sat by the co-op when I drive up from Boston to Vermont a lot, and I bought. Uh, I think I actually have it. There's a, a bread I bought, and um, if this tells you anything about brands, when I grew up, it was Wonder Bread builds strong, strong bodies, twelve ways. This was the headline on the whole wheat bread. Uh, Dave's bread, 15 years in prison. 
Which naturally appealed to you. Yeah, and I, yeah, it was natural. <laughs> I, I bought it. It was really good. Uh, and, and it talks about personal transformation and second chances, and he comes back to the family bakery, and everyone is capable of greatness. So, okay, you got a loaf of bread, which was okay. Um, and, and it's all about Dave and being a felon and 15 years of hard time and coming back, and he had a second chance, and he's transformed. And, and it's, it's, it's a story of redemption in a loaf of bread. Okay? What does that tell you about the culture? It tells you that how we think about our relationships and our relationships to things in our life is extraordinarily personal. And the story, you want to be part of the story. Everything has to have a meaning for you. You know, this, this is not just a cup. Maybe this is Dave's cup, you know. I mean, it, everything's got to, it's got to have background. It's got to have context. And so pe people want something authentic. I, it, when we travel, uh, I'll take little iPhone videos, right, or my editors, one of my editors does, uh, and we'll come back and, and we'll post two stories on Instagram. One will be highly produced, you know, big production values, blah, blah, blah. And then I'll just throw a 20-second video that I took with my camera. The one I take with my camera gets five times the views. Nobody wants the production. Nobody wants high production. If I was free to lay or Pepsi right now, uh, you know, I'd be a little concerned because no one wants a corporate experience. That's a terrible word right now. People want a personal experience. So, to answer the question, is, is how do you think about a second, ch my, my redemption and second chance, you know, in the food world, is, is, is thinking about what that means and, and how you work with your customers and your fans or whatever. You have to be authentic, you have to be real. Uh, if you make a mistake, you have to say so. And you, you have to be, uh, you have to have a very real relationship. You can't make, you can't fake it. And I think advertising for most of its life has been about faking it. Um, you know, there was a, um, I'll digress just one more time. Uh, <laughs> my favorite person in the 20th century, not because he was a good guy, was Edward Bernays. Do you know who he was? He was Sigmund Freud's nephew. He invented modern advertising. And uh, I'll give you just one example. Uh, Lucky Strike came to him and said in the 1920s, we want you to convince women to smoke because that was a big market, untapped market. So he called a friend of his at Vogue. He got 20 debutantes to march in an Easter parade down Fifth Avenue, stop at 42nd Street where there was a, a pool of reporters and photographers. They all took cigarettes out, lit them, and they referred to them as torches of freedom. A cigarette, you know. It was, big, it was about women's rights, you know, right? It, it was, and it was about the right to vote and the, the, the rights to do anything a man could do. And so he turned cigarettes into a political statement. He also ended up killing a lot of women who ended up getting <laughs> cancer, but that's another matter. But my, my point being that there's an inauthenticity to how products have been marketed, you know, and, and I think that's, I don't think that's going to survive. Long -term. Um, all right, so we'll come back on some business topics, sort of the suits side of things, but um, I want to come back to Michael Pollan, plant-based food. So it, if you read through Milk Street, it just seems as though a much higher percentage of the content is focused on vegetables than was the case in the Cook's Illustrated era. Do you, is that right? And do you think that's going to continue? Do you think that's a secular trend that's going to continue to Continue to well, thank grow you, because we have a book called Vegetables coming out in two months. Well, so thank you, thank you for that. Yeah, of course. That was not a setup. Um, sure, I mean, if you think about meat, I mean, uh, meat was, is still very expensive in most places in the world, and so meat was never at the center of the plate. It was for the English, the beef eaters. Um, but if, if you look at, it was either, you know, very little meat or meat was used as a seasoning. And that's a much more interesting way to eat because, you know, Fanny Farmer, when she did recipes in the 1896 cookbook, first of all, the vegetable chapter was, you know, like this. The sugar <laughs> chapter was like this and the meat, but... You know. Uh, and it was, I looked up a recipe for, I forgot what it was, it was half a cup of cream and two sticks of butter, you know, just put, put the dairy on it, you know, <laughs> smother it. Um, so we've never had a great tradition, but other places in the world, when the grains and meat, et cetera, Middle East, for example, well, they had spices, you know, they, they had ways of thinking about those foods. You know, if you take an eggplant and cook the hell out of it on a grill, uh, and then open it up and scoop it out, and you add some pomegranate molasses and some tahini and some sesame seeds and some cilantro. It's absolutely terrific. Now, the kind of eggplant that Will and I grew up with <laughs> was not terrific. So, uh, yeah, it, it, vegetables have great flavor if you know how to cook them. And so I, I think meat as one of the things, 
it's one of your options. But if, if you look at the mastery of French cooking, there are almost no spices, really. And you know, Northern Europe had pepper, because that was part of the trade uh, from the Far East, but uh, and some nutmeg and cinnamon. My mother, uh, she passed years ago, but I, she used to have a little place up in the Adirondacks. And I, I, for fun, I would look through her little pantry. And it was the same spice jars from the Eisenhower administration. I mean, it hadn't <laughs> changed at all. Uh, it was nutmeg, cinnamon, sir. So when you have chilies and you have all those other things, it just completely transforms things other than meat because it, it just, it's much more subtle, it's much more sophisticated, uh, and it, you know, they t it just tastes great. Yes? What's your favorite spice? Uh, this is, comes from uh, Anna Sortun at the Oleana restaurant in Cambridge. If you haven't That's been there, you should go. Turkish. Um, and in the 1990s, uh, she, for the first time, went to Turkey and just discovered this amazing cuisine. Of course, cuisines. And I interviewed her years ago, and she, her, her comment was, it's the sitar, stupid. She just put sitar on everything. She said, that's why she was successful. She just put sitar on everything. Uh, and sitar is, is a wild herb. It's, some people say it's like thyme. It's kind of like marjoram and thyme savory together, big leaves. Uh, it, it's turned into a, a, a spice blend with sesame seeds and, uh, um, uh, and it'll come to me in a second, uh, and the, the, the small sumac, the small red berries, which are a little sour and citrusy. Uh, and it's an all-purpose blend that goes on virtually everything. Um, so I would say that's, and, and a lot of places in the world, like the Middle East, every family will have their own spice blend, or in Ethiopia, mm. the Berber, mm. you know, it's, it's ground to order, and so you have your own formula. So a lot of families just have a spice blend and they put it on everything. And so I, I would say having your own spice blend and, and just having that there in the pantry, I mean, I cook out of the pantry all the time. It's just a great way to cook because um, you know, you're halfway there already. So. Um, okay, so I'm gonna borrow a page out of Sam Sifton's book. And we're gonna do a lightning round here. <laughs> I'm keeping an eye on the clock. So I'm gonna tick through a bunch of food. Who's my favorite artist? Food related, we'll get there, yeah. <laughs> um, then we'll come back to one business topic I want to hit before we open it up for broader Q&A. So the first question is, dinner party. Who do you invite, living or dead? There are five seats. You can invite anybody, but they have to have, they have to be foodies. Not, you're not allowed to invite Sam or Ruth. Because or, they're here. They, <laughs> oh, they can't so who, be so who they would can't you invite? Be no, they have to be foodies. Who's, who's at the party? Is alive or dead? Alive or dead. Hard one. Um, uh, I think you'd have to go for Karem from the 19th century. I mean, look, I mean, you asked me. I mean, I want Okay, how many people know who Karem is? You know, Raise your hand. Anton Karem. No, you know, no. I think, you know, uh, great a quick... chef, pastry chef. Um, I would say uh, Escoffier, definitely. I don't know if he can tell a good joke or not, but. Um, and then you need someone um, who. Uh, You'd have to get someone like who makes good pizza or something. I mean, you have to mix that up Definitely. from like Avenue J in Brooklyn or something. Uh, yeah, yeah. One of those guys, you yeah. know, that would be great. Um, and uh, you know, uh, a great food writer, I think. Uh, who was it? I just read. Oh, um, uh, was that wonderful book by the uh, uh, Ruth will know. Um, uh, Epitaph for a Peach was the name of the book, and that was just a lovely, it was one of the best books I've ever written about food. It's just huh. terrific. Uh, am I at the four now? Four, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I've always, you know, uh, uh, I, I always loved Genghis Khan. I mean, just in general. <laughs> so I Noted don't know if he was a foodie, Noted but foodie. I would love to ask him a bunch of questions because <laughs> he invented toll roads and had a 4,000 mile <laughs> empire, and he's, you know, I, except you might eat me for dinner. <laughs> all right, all right, so keep moving here. So, favorite kitchen item? Uh, th this is a setup. This, this would be a knife, actually, uh, that we designed called the Kinchinto. It's a, it's a combination between a Nakiri, which is a vegetable knife from Japan, and a Chinese cleaver. Like, Chinese cleavers are like my favorite thing in the world, um, but it's like a hybrid. Um, and, uh, you know, the, I don't know if you know this, but European knives. Kitchen knives were designed from a long history of European knives, which were daggers. And a lot of these were quite long, and you keep them in your boot or other place. And they had a, they had a rule, this is in Spain, that you, unless you were wealthy, of course, 
Uh, you couldn't have a knife with a blade longer than the width of your palm. Um, so all, all the rich people ran around with these huge daggers. <laughs> but if you look at the design, they're, they're essentially the European chef's knife comes from that tradition. So I think European chef's knives uh, are a really horrible design, unless, unless you're a chef, because you really need a lot of skill, because there's a lot of metal in there. You have to have a lot of control. It's, it's like driving a Ferrari if you're used to driving a 61 VW. Uh, it gets out of control, it's dangerous. So I, I think a knife that's really designed for everyday cooking, and a, a cleaver like a Chinese cleaver, you can buy a Chinese cleaver for $17, $20. Uh, they're great. Uh, you can do almost everything with it. Uh, so I'm a big fan of, of that versus the European chef's knife. Yeah. Okay. Two lesser known cookbooks you'd recommend. And maybe Epitaph for a Peach counts, but two others if so. Um, that's a very good question. I would say, uh, well, I'll, I'll take a uh, recent one um, Feast about the Middle East. Uh, I, I don't remember her name. I, I went to visit her in Lebanon a few years ago. Uh, and that book uh, is an extraordinary book. I mean, she has like 15 different flatbreads that you've never heard of from the Middle East. I mean, she did just a wonderful, it's sort of like, uh, I think someone mentioned Jubilee, Sam Sifton earlier, mm. by Tony Tipton Martin, which is a phenomenal book. Uh, but it's like that, except it's about the Middle East. It's that level. She, she's, her research is amazing. Uh, the photography is great. And, you know, it, it's amazing to me that, that Arab cuisine, which, of course, is too broad a term, but it really doesn't have much room in our bookshelves here, you know, whereas that food is just amazing. Uh, I've spent a lot of time there, and it's terrific. So I, I would say Feast. Uh, 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 Helu, Anissa Helu, H-E-L-O-U. Yeah, that's a great book. Um, and then one of my favorite books from a long time is French Cooking in 10 Minutes. Uh, and I saw Ruth, and it starts out, and the first sentence is something like, this is, I'm telling you this is a great book, and I know because I wrote it, or something. <laughs> a little flippant. But one of his pieces of advice is the first thing you should do when you go in the kitchen is put a pot of water on to boil, which I thought was actually quite good advice. So I'll, All right. those are both ends of the spectrum. All right, so then one piece of cooking advice. Uh, my, my piece of cooking advice is please salt your food. Um, it just drives me crazy. Uh, if you, 95% of your salt intake comes not from your home cooking. It comes from processed food, it comes from restaurants, it comes from, you know. So very little of your salt comes from what you cook at home. And uh, unless you have a specific condition, fine. But if you don't, um, if you don't salt your food, it's not going to taste good. So when you finish your soup or your stew, whatever, something that you can adjust at the last minute, your you know, sauce, uh, taste it. And it's that 30 seconds that makes all the difference. You can go from good to great or inedible to good. Uh, and the other things you can add, you can add a little bit of ginger at the end. You can add a little bit of garlic at the end. You can add a little vinegar at the end. You can add a little sour, like pomegranate molasses at the end. Just adjusting the dish just before you serve it and tasting it four or five times if you watch a chef cook, that's what they do. Uh, and they'll do that throughout the process. But it, it just is a game changer. But, but please, I, so many people are afraid. Of, I don't know who, who got us onto this salt's going to kill you thing. But it's, cooking at home, the amount of salt you use is just not an issue. I mean, assuming you, you know, have some moderation. As Julia Child once paraphrased someone else, I think, said that you know, all things in moderation, including moderation, so, which I like. <laughs> Uh, one of the primary fringe benefits of your current job is you get to take trips to cool places with some regularity. I think you're going to Crete in about a month for a week. So what's, what was the most surprisingly cool place you've been to for Milk Street? Um, uh, Cuisine, food, culture-wise? Well, I'll tell two things. When I was in Taipei, I made um, scallion pancakes with an 85-year-old woman uh, and... I didn't speak Mandarin, and she obviously didn't speak English. Uh, and she tried to show me how to do it. It's actually very hard to do because you're you're rolling the dough, but you're twisting at the same time. And you know, I'm pretty good at pie pastry, but this is another level. So she kept saying, "No, no, no," like this. You know, it's like, like whacking me with a rolling pin. You know, <laughs> and, then, and then I said, "Okay, now you, now I'm going to teach you to make American pie dough." And she screwed that up. And I said, "No, no, no." <laughs> so, we, we, and, but the best part was that she was 80, and at the end. Her mother shows up. 
who's like 95, you know, it's like just making sure she still did it right. So I'm going like, okay, this is a family tradition, you know, this is good. Um, the other thing was I was in Mexico City a couple years ago, and uh, we went down the Chinampas, you know, the southern part of the city and the canals from the Aztec time and the floating islands, which are no longer floating. But we went out um, on a little barge and uh, with Eduardo Garcia, and we cooked beans. So I, I traveled 1,500 miles and got on a boat for half an hour to cook beans and uh, on a wood fire on a Chinampas, Chinampa, I guess, uh, and they were amazing. And huh. the thing I learned from him, and this is a, just, just shows how, how much we have to learn, or I have to learn. Um, he did a, a sofrito, right? So there's some garlic and chilies and peppers and stuff, uh, and onion. And he added it at the end of cooking. And I said, what are you doing? You, you add sofrito at the beginning of cooking. He said, yeah, if you want to ruin the flavor. <laughs> but I mean, why would you add it at the beginning? Because you make this wonderful thing in 10 minutes in a pan, and it's bright and fresh. So he added it to the beans right before serving. And I went like, okay, there goes 40 years of culinary education out the window. I mean, why do we add sofrito at the beginning? Well, I, okay, there, there are cases where it makes sense. But in this recipe, it was just a complete game changer. And, and we ate, he forgot the spoons. So we had blue corn tortillas and spoons. And, and, and they had these huge, uh, uh, these huge bottles of beer uh, called turtles, which translated. Uh, and so we had a lot of beer and tortillas and beans. It was one of the best meals I had in my life, but it was just beans. It's just a great, you know. Beans, can, beans are really good. <laughs> um, okay, I want to circle back on a business topic. So if you look at Milk Street, it's almost unrecognizable from what a publishing business would have looked like even 10 years ago. So there's, you can't buy it on a newsstand. There's no advertising in it. It's moving increasingly from the idea of subscription to one of membership. So it's just very, very different on multiple levels. The biggest difference is the presence of an online store. So can you talk a little bit, Chris, about the concept for the store, how it's developed, developed, how you're thinking about it, and what the relationship should be between the editorial product and the store, raw, kind of raw commerce. Again, church and state, should they be separate? Should they be blended? Well, there is no church and state anymore. I mean, it used to be, as, as, you know, as Ruth said this morning. Secular and profane, sorry. Secular well, and profane, yeah. Yeah, but I, I think we've incorporated buying things as part of who we are. You know, it's a reflection of who we are. It used to be the car you bought, you know, but now it's like, what kind of tahini do you buy? That tells me a lot about who you are. Do you buy that pasty, awful stuff in the can in the supermarket, or do you buy the good, pourable stuff from the West Bank? So, um, yeah, I, I don't see a separation there. At first I was concerned, like, you know, can you sell things at the same time? As well, no, they're just together. I, I do think, though, that what's happening is in the supermarket, we talk about elevated essentials, which means, yeah, you, you can get a lot of things in the supermarket, but they're not great, you know? I mean, it's getting better, but we really want to find the best tahini, you know? We want to find, we go to Cambodia when we're there, we find somebody who has these great peppercorns, you know? So, or, or if you want to have um, uh, gochujang, right? Some gochujang is made in 24 hours. Good gochujang is made in 10 years, you know? So, if you get the good ingredients, your cooking is, you almost can't screw it up. I mean, it's just gonna be good. So our mission was to go around the world and find this stuff uh, in our travels, or do it online too, but to get the samples in and taste them and make them available. So I just think, I'm a big fan of cooking out of your pantry. If you have a good pantry, and it only costs you a few hundred bucks to, to stock a great pantry, then, then it's just really easy to cook. And so why not go get the good stuff? Because, I mean, let's take fish sauce, right? I mean, good fish sauce doesn't taste fishy. It's umami, you know, it's just, that's what it is. But bad fish sauce, you know, is, is bad fish sauce. <laughs> but most of us have had bad fish sauce, and that's why we, if you say fish sauce, people go, what's in that fish sauce? Oh, no, I want nothing. Uh, but if you make, you know, caramel shrimp or something, a Vietnamese dish, or caramel chicken, there's fish sauce in it, but it, it's just going to provide depth of flavor. Um, I was cooking with Sunoco Sakai in L.A. a month ago, and uh, her uh, miso, she makes her own miso, I was blown away. I mean, I've had miso, of course, but th she, she has her jar, you know, and it's been months fermenting, and it's this incredible, wonderful color. And I took a taste, and it was like the most amazing thing I've ever tasted in my life, and nothing like the commercial miso I've had. So getting those ingredients, making them available, is, is helpful. Uh, and it's a lot of hard work, because you've got to go find it and 
you know, right now, as you know, getting stuff shipped is really hard, and you can't find a container anywhere in the world. You know, I was just on the phone this morning, and we have a bunch of stuff coming from Japan and other places, and they say, well, we have the stuff, but you know, we have no way of getting it to you because, because everything's backed up. But, but I think it's just access to good ingredients, staples, you know, and that's, that's great. And it sort of feeds the editorial and vice versa, right? Is that the, the way you see it? Sort of, it well, relationship we, have, we to the actually editor. have, you know, the producers uh, of some of these items give our online cooking courses. We now give, we used to have a brick and mortar cooking school, and now it's on Zoom. It's so much better because we can have someone in London or in Ho Chi Minh City or in Senegal and Dakar give a course, and you can take a course from someone right there who's lived their whole lives there, who, who is authentically knowledgeable. Uh, and some of these people are people who produce some of the products that we sell because they know a lot about the food. And so they're, they're editorial you know, mm -hmm. at the same time. So. OK, great. Um, we are going to open it up to questions. Sean appears to have the mic back there, as does Wes. We're well armed. Questions? I, I'll say what uh, a friend of mine used to say, uh, uh, Lynn Rosetta Casper, she used to do a lot of these events. We did a couple together. My mic just, oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah. Someone wanted me to stop talking, I think. Uh, she always used to say, if I don't get a question, I'm going to stand here and take all my clothes off. And, and she always got a question. So I won't oh, say that. Did you see that? That got the hand right there, Chris. It always Very works. effective. Very effective. Every recipe that calls for a large egg does not live in Bar Harbor. Those chickens lay green eggs, blue eggs, brown eggs. Not one of them is the same size. What is the measurement or weight of a large egg? You know, I think it's <laughs> five ounces. I, I have to look it up. We, we, we did that in the magazine a couple of years ago. And you could just, or you could just look it up online. Uh, you just weigh it, and you should get a digital scale, uh, which I love uh, and swear by. Um, and it, it has small, medium, large. I'd also say, though, when I go to the supermarket, Sometimes I get my eggs supermarket, and I get large eggs. They're like extra large eggs, and then if you buy medium eggs, they're large eggs. And then I, I don't, I don't think it's it's rigorously. I don't think there's an inspector there looking at it. But you can you can go online in two seconds and get the ounce measurement, and just if it's five eggs, you can just multiply it and then just weigh it, you know. And but it also it depends. Like if you're making pancakes or something, it doesn't matter. Uh, it, it depends on the recipe. Sometimes it just doesn't matter that much. Got questions back here, it looks like. Oh, hello. Thank you. And I'm just wondering if, uh, now that we're coming off a, a very tumultuous year, and I'm thinking particularly about the pandemic and also the calls for social justice, um, what are the most exciting aspects of, quote, the food world that you see sort of responding to the moment? It's a good question. It's changed. In the last two years, I would say a complete change. Uh, we went through every recipe we've ever done uh, to check, to make sure we gave full credit <laughs> to the person we worked with. Uh, we, we pay people when we travel uh, if, if they're going to spend time with us. Uh, we think that's really important. And we think giving context is really important as well. So um, from our perspective, uh, what's, what's most important is we're just the host. You know, we're just presenting somebody. And so if we're in Dakar, we're there with somebody who's cooking, Pierre Cham, whomever, and it's their story and their recipe. And so we're just trying to be the go-between between the reader and that person. But I think it's really, um, I, I, don't think, I don't think cultures necessarily own recipes per se, but I think as a journalist, the first rule is you want to give credit and, and make sure people understand context. I, I think what people get in trouble sometimes is they take a recipe from a culture, but they don't understand the context and why it's done that way, and then they just mess around with it, it that's not okay. I mean, you, you, you need to have a starting point that's clear. And then you can say, well, you know, we, we can't get that ingredient here, so this is what we did to make it uh, work for you. There's a translation process. I mean, think about what Julia, Julia went to the Cornell for six months, almost didn't graduate. Um, Simone Beck was the person with the recipes. But Julia was brilliant at saying, well, how would someone in an American kitchen cook uh, a chicken? 
because the chicken in the American kitchen is about a third as good as the one that Simone Beck has. So how do I make that translation? So that's what she did. She was a translator, really. And I think that's, that's valuable. But I think it's all about context and credit. And so people really understand, you know, why does someone, you want to understand why does someone cook this way, right? And once you understand that, then you've learned something you can apply. But if you just mess around with recipes and fuse everything together, I don't think it's that helpful. Tony. on at all or worry about? And if so, how do you, how do you get to them? No, I, I don't need the mic. I, he's, he projects. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the question is, you know, how do you reach or talk to or do you want to talk to people who are not foodies? I, I don't like the term foodie. I don't know what that means. Um, I, I, I'm really I'm much more focused on I just want people to get in the kitchen. So uh, I, for me, it's making the recipes as accessible and simple as possible. And, and taking away, you know, it used to be when I was younger in, in the food world in the 60s and 70s, you know, foreign cuisine, however you want to call it, I don't like that term, or ethnic cuisine, another term I don't like, was exotic. Another term I don't like. I mean, it's not exotic, it's just what someone's making for, for lunch or dinner somewhere else in the world. That's all it is. It's like if you're in Azerbaijan, you know, dinner is just dinner. It, it may look strange to us, but it's, it, you know, it's just their dinner. So I think the way to do that is to take all that away and just say, look, it's just what someone's cooking somewhere else in some other place in the world. Make it feel approachable. Get to know the people. Uh, and it's not, I don't want to put this on a pedestal. I, I'm totally against putting food on a pedestal. I mean, unless you're having a $500 meal at Le Bernardin, but that's different. But I, I just think food, someone told me a long time ago, a guy in Westport, Connecticut, Julius School, ran a delicatessen, he was famous for suing Paul Newman, but that's a long story. But Julius once said to me, at the height of this foodie thing in the 80s, he said, you know, it's just food. And what he, he didn't mean was food's not important. He meant, of course food's important. It's part of our life. But it should just be part of our life. It shouldn't be something that's, that's special and outside of our normal daily existence. So the answer to your question is to make food part of every day, not to oversell it, not to make it feel like it's a special occasion. It's not Saturday night cooking. It's what you're having for, for, for dinner Tuesday night. We wrote a book called Tuesday Nights for that reason. I want people just to go in the kitchen for 10 minutes and cook something. I don't care what it is, just cook something, please. Uh, and so that's, that's my answer, is I don't want to talk to foodies. I want to talk to people who, you know, might want to try to cook, you know, that's all. And maybe we can get them in the kitchen, you know, or spend a little more time there. Hold on, there's a, there's a mic. There's a mic I, I can here. repeat the question. Do you get in the kitchen and cook with your family? Do I get in the kitchen and cook with my family? Um, let me tell you the secret about people who do this for a living. Uh, it's like the shoemakers. Uh, during the week, I eat all the time because we have five or six people in the kitchen. I have to taste all the food. Well, I know. I, I can tell you're all feeling very sympathetic to me right now. Um, but, you know, I, I eat all day. And so when I get home, uh, well, often I'll take food home like we all do from the kitchen. We don't waste anything. So during the week, very often, you know, not so much. Weekends, yes, or when I'm in Vermont. I do a lot of cooking. I love to cook. But uh, during the week, I've eaten eight things during the day. And so I'm pretty full by the time. I mean, I think all of our cooks probably don't eat dinner very much. But the weekends, I'll, I'll spend you know, all day Sunday cooking. Whatever, and occasionally I'll, I'll make up something quick during the week for the kids. Um, but getting kids to eat things that are not white or brown is, I mean, I, Kenji Lopez Alf was out to visit us recently, and I was, he has a daughter who's four years old, three and a half years old, and says, she eats everything. And I say, Kenji, you're lying to me. This, <laughs> this is not true. She can't possibly. So, well, she eats almost everything. But he's, he's done a very good job of, of getting her to eat everything. And I think if you, um, if you don't give them a choice, you know, this is, everyone's going to eat the same thing. And that's my philosophy, too, is you don't have two separate dinners, you have one dinner. And then, but I, you know, so weekends, yes, during the week, not so much.
You briefly just mentioned the issue of food waste in the test kitchen. Um, I used to work for a food photographer, and I was shocked at the amount of food waste that goes on behind the scenes in food media. And I was wondering how you address that in your business and testing recipes, in styling and photographing them. What outlets do you have for that? We food? don't have, um, the, the problem is always you have to be certified by the health board in the city to distribute food, cook food, and that's a very high hurdle. So um, at, at the old place and new place, we're not certified by the health board, but we don't throw anything out. Uh, we have 45 people in our company, of which 25 or 30 are in and around the office, so uh, I don't think we throw anything out. It's all packaged. You know, we, we, what happens is we cook food, if it's photographed or whatever, or I taste the food, then it goes out into our long table in our central area, and y you can tell how good it is by the sound <laughs> from my office. All of a sudden I hear a lot of people, and it's like, it's like you know, <laughs> chocolate cakes is up. You know, so. <laughs> Uh, and so most of it gets eaten right there, and if not, then it's, we have takeout containers. It's all put in takeout take containers. People put their name on it, throw it in the walk-in fridge, and take it home. So we don't, we don't throw anything out. And we, we, we will give canned goods and other things away. We also do um, a fair amount of nonprofit work with Big Sisters and Little Sisters and Boys and Girls Club, and we're working on some national programs. We do mentoring classes in, in, at Milk Street. Uh, we also, during COVID, did a lot online. Uh, Zoom classes, so we take some of our resources and put them. We have someone, a director of education, whose job is primarily to do that. So we also do that as sort of a part of giving back. But we don't, we don't really waste food. I mean, I think the problem is in the old days, food photography. They used to spray it with stuff, and we don't. None of our food is fake or sprayed or treated. So. Yes. Our two favorite foods or recipes come from cooks. Uh, the French onion soup, if you've ever made that. Oh, yeah? And the Caesar salad, absolutely fantastic. But I had a question, and that is, do you, do you uh, prefer to cook by weight or by volume? Uh, if I'm baking, I, uh, by weight, mostly. Um, as I said, I have a digital scale. I have a small one that fits in the drawer, which is nice. It's easy to read. You can tear, that is, reset to zero. You can go from ounces to grams, whatever. Um, and so I, I, do, I do by weight, especially baking. I mean, it, the, we did a test years ago with flour, a cup of all-purpose flour. And some people came up with five ounces, and some people came up with 4.2 ounces, and some people came up with 5.6 ounces. So uh, in baking, it's absolutely critical to weigh. And in Europe, of course, they do. And we also now, we weigh in grams. We list in grams, which is a much easier way of weighing. Um, so I'm, I'm, I really like weight. And of course, the other problem is, you know, what's a, what's a cup of minced parsley? You know, is it deep? When they say tightly packed, what does that mean? <laughs> I still can't figure that out. I mean, is it kind of loosely packed? But you know, it's like so. I think weight's really the way to go. Yes, one question back there. Yes, thank you. Uh, do you have any favorite tips, kitchen tips, like you have in the Cooks Illustrated, like top two or three kitchen tips for us? Sure. Thank you. Uh, besides salting your food? <laughs> um, yeah, the, the number one thing is to have a sharp knife. And I did a survey a few years ago. 70% of all people at home has never sharpened their knives. So 70% of you have never sharpened your knives. I'm looking at you now. Uh, you know who you are. Um, look, a dull knife, you're going you're gonna to cut yourself. Uh, there, will, there will be blood. You know? And it makes, it makes cooking awful. I mean, you, you should be able to take an onion and, and chop it up in under a minute with a sharp knife. A dull knife, you're going to be sitting there. From, I used to have a, a CFO at the old company, and I used her uh, as a guinea pig. And I'd say, uh, here are three cloves of garlic. I want you to mince them. I came back in 20 minutes, you know, and she's still going at it. <laughs> So having a, a knife sharpener, uh, you can use an electric one. I mean, professional cooks don't like them. They like sharpening stones. I have one that's a, a diamond sharpening stone that actually works great uh, and is terrific. But keep your knife sharp would be the number one. Two, um, don't, um, if you're going to heat up a pan of skillet, put a little oil in it, just vegetable oil, 
and when it just starts to smoke, you know it's ready. Uh, don't heat up a dry pan because it'll be too hot, uh, and you, then you know when it's done. Um, uh, and three, uh, it, it, my other piece of advice is you don't have to brown your meat. I mean, this is, you know, of my many life-changing events other than being arrested in Philadelphia years ago. This is it. Uh, it turns out that most places when they cook stews and stuff, what you can do is not saute your meat at all. Uh, you can saute some onions, sofrito, but I'll put that in. And you cook it for an hour in a Dutch oven with a top on, like at 350, 375. Take the top off and finish cooking it for another hour, hour and a half. It'll brown because you're, you're sort of braising it, the, the meat's above the liquid. So you, you get perfectly brown meat and you don't have to do any work. So this, that's why I hate beef bourguignon. That's like, I, I have this crusade to end, <laughs> to end beef bourguignon. You're really going to take those little pearl onions and all that? No, no, you're not. It's just, what a pain. And, and then everything, you know, I, I do love French cooking, so, but, you know, then everything tastes like, like beef. It's like, it, it's a one-note thing, you know, whereas a lot of the other stews, even Italian stews, other things, you know, you have this note, you have that note, and you have sour, and you have salty, and you have bitter. Bitter is a great thing, right? I mean, most, most cuisines in the world use bitter. Well, we don't use bitter. I mean, the South does a little bit, but, you know, so, so variety. I mean, ultimately, a great recipe, someone described it this way. You take a bite, and you go, yeah, this is good. You take another bite, oh, there's that in it. And you take another bite, oh, there's sour here. And then you take another bite, well, it's kind of slightly sweet. Uh, and then there's tarragon, and there's ginger. So you, most of the world has these complex flavors and textures going around, you know, and it's creamy, it's, it's this, it's that. And so even on the eighth bite, you're still having a new experience. I would not say that's Northern European cooking. Northern European cooking is depth of flavor and subtlety of flavor, which is great, but it's not going to be every bite's different. And, and then every bite different thing is really the Milk Street thing. It's like, well, we didn't invent it, but that's what I love. It's like every bite, you know, something else is going on. So. I think, any other questions? Oh, one right here. Final question, final word. Have you ever had a Julia Child drop the chicken moment? <laughs> Have I ever had a Julia Child drop the chicken moment? Yes, but Julia Child never dropped the chicken. Now, let me tell you why I know that, because I know her producer was my producer for years, uh, and he had to go through, years ago they did a, they did a thing with all of her all shows. He, he watched every show. She never dropped the chicken. So I just, you know, uh -huh. it's just one of those, you know, things, like there are not crocodiles in the sewer system in New York, I don't know, whatever. Um, I did. I, I had a, a Boston Globe or some magazine was, came up to the farm in Vermont, and I had a peach and blueberry tart, um, which I'd made, and they're all milling around, and I, I put it in the oven, at which point it slid off the back onto the floor <laughs> of the oven. Uh, and so I said to them, why don't you go outside, and you know, well, I'll get you some iced tea and relax. And I, I, literally in 10 minutes, I made it from scratch. I, I, I started the dough, I rolled it out, I put it in the pan, and then I didn't have any peaches left, I just had blueberries with the blueberries in, put it in, and then we had lunch and everything else, and then the photographer goes like, wasn't that a peach blueberry tart? <laughs> I said, no, no, it was just blueberry tart, really. You must have been thinking about somebody else. So yeah, I've had, I've had more than a few of those. I mean, as Julia always said, she's right, so, you know, don't, tell, don't tell people what it is until you serve it, because you know, that, that souffle is a Bakewell tart, you know, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and the other thing I've learned is, you know, if, if you, it depends how good your marriage is, but, um, if there's a little bit of thing going on there about cooking, uh, get your spouse to make the entree, and you make the first and last thing. That's all people remember, is the first and last thing. <laughs> so, the dessert, if they go away, the dessert's good, you're good. <laughs> but they're not going to remember the meatloaf for the, or the beef bourguignon. They won't care about it. All right, please join me in thanking Chris. Thank you both. Well, you two, are, you two are really rangy, right? <laughs> and someone that is very rangy is, Will? Rangy. Rangy, yep. that's right. Very well, I, was thinking, I, I hoped you would say more Jeeves and Worcester. <laughs> but that was... <laughs> <laughs> so two things to send us off tonight. Um, first, a reminder, we have a pairing of events tomorrow that take a very different 
track. Uh, we've talked a lot about food production, food consumption, preparation. Tomorrow it's service in the morning. So come and come to both of those sessions because they're, they're interrelated. And then, as we normally do, we're going up to the red bricks. Um, Chris's book is going to be available there and he will be signing books up there. So don't you know, harangue him as he gets off the stage. Let's move up to the red bricks and do the uh, toasting, talking, and, and signing up there. Okay? See you tomorrow.